morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Jim for inviting me here today and giving me the, the less uplifting of the topics of the, of the morning. So especially following the HER2 positive talk, it's kind of hard to talk about triple negative. But I do think there are some um, bright lights on the horizon, or at least some information I think will be important to us going forward. Um, so I have to show the obligatory slide, which actually I don't think Christy or Tom actually showed because, you know, we always have to show this. Um, as you know, triple negative really is an entity that's been around for a long time. You know, it's basically cancers that are ER negative, PR negative, and HER2 negative. But it really came to the forefront when the intrinsic subset uh, typing became available. And as you remember, you know, they looked at 50 genes, ended up clustering these different subtypes, and they identified this basal subtype. And just as I'm going to talk about later on, basal is not necessarily triple negative, but also so triple negatives, of course, are not all basal. But the reason for showing this is because it actually shows, as Tom showed us earlier, the natural history of these triple negative breast cancers with a very high recurrence rate over the first two to three years, a very poor survival. But an important point that Tom also made is that at five years, you can see the recurrence rate really drops down significantly, and it's considerably less than what we see in these late recurrences from ER positive breast cancers. And I think when you see a patient with triple negative breast cancer, especially obviously early stage breast cancer, that's a good point to bring home because obviously there's a lot of scary data out there on, on the internet about these type of breast cancers. Um, <clears throat> so what's the story with these cancers? Well, they tend to be high grade, not always, but in general. And as I showed you, they have a high propensity to distant metastasis in the short term, also have a higher rate of brain metastasis than you know, ER positive breast cancers. Now, the poor outcome for these cancers is definitely multifactorial, but what I'm going to kind of talk about today is two things I think that are important and do contribute to the poor outcome. The first one is chemotherapy resistance. Um, there's no way that we're going to get away from using chemotherapy in, for triple negative breast cancers any time in the near future. And as I'll show you, the problem is that only about a third of triple negative breast cancers truly benefit from chemotherapy. And then the other very important question is the fact that we don't have that magic bullet for triple negative breast cancers. We haven't found a really sustainable molecular target towards which novel agents can be developed. So that's, there's a lot of research ongoing to try and find these, but currently we don't really have anything at this time point. Um, so what I'm going to cover today is <clears throat> some subtyping on triple negative. Jim mentioned that they're not all the same. It's an umbrella term. We'll talk about that. I'm going to focus a bit on about preoperative chemotherapy because I kind of think that's where we should go in treating triple negative breast cancer. And then we'll review some of the data with chemotherapeutics and also uh, targeted agents in the preoperative and, and metastatic setting for triple negative breast cancer. And then lastly, <clears throat> I'll kind of address the issue brought up with, by the question, and that is, you know, wh what are we doing for chemo-resistant triple negative breast cancer in patients that fail to get a complete response uh, from preoperative chemotherapy? Um, so this is kind of <clears throat> a lesson to learn, of course. You're all familiar with this trial. And Nipper was kind of the, the drug that we were all so excited about for triple negative breast cancer because of the very positive results seen in the phase two setting. But as you're all aware, when we looked at it in the phase three setting, unfortunately, it didn't look so promising. So this is basically looking at the addition of aniparib, which at the time was thought to be a PARP inhibitor, combined with gemcitabine and carboplatin or gemcitabine and carboplatin alone. The progression-free survival did not meet the criteria for significance, although there was a month difference in favor of aniparib. The overall survival, as you can see, was really pretty dismal. It was less than a year in both arms, but no difference in the patients that got aniparib. So people have kind of talked about, well, why was this, this uh, trial negative? Aniparib is not really a PARP inhibitor at the doses that we give it in in breast cancer. But the truth is that we basically lumped all triple negative breast cancers together. And this is what happens when you don't actually pick the correct cancers to investigate your drugs in. Um, you know, <clears throat> Christy was talking a lot about trastuzumab. If you look <clears throat> back to the original trastuzumab data, if we had looked at trastuzumab in all breast cancers, we wouldn't have that drug now. So I think the lesson from this <clears throat> trial essentially is that, as I'm going to show you now, we're going to have to really design trials for triple negative breast cancer based on the type of triple negative breast cancer we're dealing with. Thank you, Jim. So um, where are we with this? Well, the best data really comes from the Vanderbilt group, and what they were able to identify were six unique subtypes of triple negative breast cancer. They evaluated gene expression profiles from 21 breast cancer data sets and ended up with just under 600 cases of triple negative breast cancer. They then used cluster analysis to subdivide these triple negative breast cancers into six different subtypes, which all had unique gene expression and ontologies. 
They then went on to go through all the breast cancer cell lines we have, and they were able to identify breast cancer cell lines that corresponded to these subtypes that they uh, determined from their gene expression analysis. <clears throat> and I don't know how many of you have read this paper. I would encourage you to read it, because it really is, is quite an interesting paper. Um, but these are the just six different subtypes they looked at. And just to remind you here that, you know, each of these little bars represents uh, the percentage of, it, uh, of each, uh, percentage of triple negatives that actually ma are made up by these different subtypes. Um, <clears throat> so as far as basal-like, I said earlier that not all triple negatives are basal-like. You can see they ident identified two different basal-like um, subtypes of triple negative breast cancer shown here. Um, the first one is your typical basal subtype, where there's a lot of um, uh, involvement of cell cycle, DNA repair, and proliferation genes. The basal-like 2, in contrast, has similar kind of genes, but also has growth factor signaling, including EGFR, WINT, IGF1R. So that's this, the, these two groups here. They then identified um, a unique immunomodulatory subtype, um, which was driven by genes uh, involved in immune cell processes. And this is this group here. And what you see, the medullary breast cancers that we see kind of rarely fit into this group. There's then a very important group. There's two mesenchymal subtypes, which as you can see actually make up a large proportion of these triple negative breast cancers. We don't know much about this mesenchymal subtype yet, but I would suspect that these are the ones that are going to be causing the problems in terms of not responding to chemotherapy, or we don't know, as I say, we don't have data to support that yet. Um, the mesenchymal, the M subtype, um, has genes associated with cell motility and EMT processes, and the MSL subtype is similar to the M subtype, but has growth factor signaling as well. And this is an interesting group because um, they actually t are the ones, sometimes you see lower grade triple negative breast cancers, and they tend to fit into this subtype, and metaplastic cancers fit into this subtype as well. And then lastly, the luminal antigen receptor subtype shown here on the bottom, very interesting, has been identified before. What they found was that there was a group of triple negative <coughs> breast cancers that actually have a luminal phenotype, but they're ER negative and PR negative. But what they have is antigen receptor and antigen receptor downstream genes. Um, so we'll talk about this later because there is some clinical data uh, with this subtype uh, uh, that, that was presented at ASCO last year. So this is kind of the subtyping. So then what they did was they identified cell lines representing the subtypes, and they went ahead and did some um, animal work where they basically looked to see if the different subtypes responded to different drugs differently. So they looked at cisplatin um, because of the DNA repair uh, effect that they found, and antiandrogen, and also PI3K kinase mTOR inhibitor. In the basal-like subtype, as you would have predicted, and this has been shown clinically, you can see that cisplatin was very effective in inhibiting these, these uh, tumors. The other drugs really weren't, as you can see shown here. In the angin receptor subtype, the uh, anti-angin was effective, as you can see in both of these uh, different models. Um, but also the PI3 kinase inhibitor was effective here, and cisplatin in this one as well. But again, just showing you that the anti-angin actually did work in these, uh, the, this, this subtype of the triple negatives. And then the mesenchymal subtype, which I really do think are the ones that are going to be the hardest to treat, they found some activity with cisplatin, but they actually found nice activity of the PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitor, as you can see uh, shown here. So I think this is very important data. Um, it's important, and it's also something that's going to be, I think, very onerous for us going forward, because if we use this type of subtyping, we can't lump triple negative breast cancers together um, again, in clinical trials, we're going to have to subtype them based on these subtypes, which is going to whittle down the numbers of patients you have for trials, and it's going to require at least a national effort, if not a global effort, to address some of these questions. But I would say I think this is the way forward to subtype these cancers and really be a lot more educated in terms of the way we treat them. <clears throat> So now, just talking about kind of where we are with chemotherapy. So um, <clears throat> my personal opinion is that if you have somebody with a triple negative breast cancer, in general, they should be a candidate for preoperative chemotherapy. The patient in the, in the clinical, the, uh, the case that Jim presented, obviously, you know, had to have chemotherapy. But even smaller cancers, I would say to you, I think we should treat them with preoperative chemotherapy. And the reason for that is because pathologic complete response is an incredibly robust predictive, uh, prognostic factor in triple negative breast cancer. I would say it's actually prog more prognostic in triple negative breast cancers than in any other breast cancer subtypes that we have. Um, this is data you've probably seen before. It's from MD Anderson, where they basically looked at the outcome for patients with triple negative breast cancer who had a PAT-CR or who had residual disease following pre-op chemo or non-triple negative breast cancer who had a PAT-CR or residual disease following uh, pre-op chemo. 
If you look at the triple negatives, what you see here is that if they have a PAT-CR, you can see this is looking at survival. 6% of the patients have died at three years. If they do not have a PAT-CR, you can see a third of the patients have actually died, most likely from breast cancer by the time you get to three years. In contrast, you can see in the ER positive cancers, pathologic complete response really is not as important a predictor. Patients who don't have a pathologic complete response actually do pretty well, as you can see. <clears throat> now, the other data with this, which I think is perhaps even more striking, is this data from the iSpy1 study. This is a study where patients got anthracyclines and taxanes preoperatively, and they did a bunch of radiologic and molecular marker, uh, markers on the tumors. And what we're looking at here is these are just uh, the tumors in the iSpy study that had a basal-like phenotype. And what they're looking at is relapse and correlating with the volume of residual disease in the breast following pre-op chemo. So RCB0 is a PAT-CR, RCB1 is just minimal cancer in the breast, RCB3 is where there's a lot of residual cancer in the breast, or in other words, they didn't respond to chemotherapy at all. So you can see, if you manage to eradicate all or most of the cancer in the breast with pre-op chemo, the relapse rate for these patients is actually pretty low. So again, these patients do very well. In contrast, if, you do, if they do not respond to chemotherapy, and like the patient in question, had a lot of cancer left uh, following pre-op chemo, their relapse rate is incredibly high. And you can see here that at 18 months, almost all these patients have relapsed. And I'm not sure we have a better prognostic factor than something like this uh, to, to give to our patients. So obviously the goal with all of this is to try and achieve a PAT-CR in your patients with triple negative breast cancer. So how often do we do that? Well, unfortunately, if you look across the trials that have been done, in general, the PAT-CR rate range, ranges from about 25% up to about 30, maybe 35%. <clears throat> this is from um, Lisa Carey's original data where she te they treated um, about 107 patients with neoadjuvant AC. And she basically were, it looked at the PAT-CR rate based on uh, breast cancer subtype. And in the basal-like shown here, it's a small number, admittedly, only a quarter of patients, as you can see, had a pathologic complete response, which means that the other three quarters are unfortunately probably destined to relapse. And now, this is just an example of one study, but if you look across the other studies that have been done, this is the number that you typically see. So we have a lot of work to do to try and improve pathologic complete response for these, or the rate of pathologic complete response for these patients because it is such an important prognostic factor. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through a couple of other chemotherapy agents that are out there. Some of this is in the pre-op setting, some of this is in the metastatic setting, just to give you a hint of what the activity of some of these chemotherapy agents are in triple negative breast cancer. So cisplatin has been kind of been around, and of course it was asked in the question as, as well, um, you know, uh, the thought being that cisplatin may be especially effective in triple negative breast cancers. And this relates kind of just very simplistically to the fact that patients with BRCA1 mutations get triple negative breast cancers. And we know from preclinical studies that cisplatin is particularly effective in BRCA mut mutated cell lines. If you look across the trials that have been done, I just want to you to focus on the bottom three here. Um, these are all patients with triple negative breast cancer treated preoperatively with cisplatin alone or bevacizumab or with other chemotherapy agents. The PAT-CR rate you can see here, 16%, 22%. That's no different from what I showed you with the AC. So again, in just unselected triple negative breast cancers, this doesn't give any indication that using cisplatin is better than any other agent that's out there. In contrast, in this very small study where they basically selected patients with BRCA1 mutations and treated them with single-agent cisplatin, they got an incredibly high PAT-CR rate of 72%, as you can see shown here. And that's why that was asked in that question <clears throat> about whether because the patient was a had a BRCA1 mutation, whether you would give her cisplatin since she had such a, an amount of residual disease uh, following uh, her, her chemotherapy. Nobody knows the right answer to this. And some patients, I would discuss it with them. But the general, in general, there's no recommendation to give further chemotherapy if they don't achieve a PAT-CR. So I would say, overall, the activity of the platinums in triple negative breast cancer appears similar to other agents. But they do appear to be effective in patients with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. And they may be effective in cancers that have other defects in DNA repair. But we don't know what those cancers are at this time point. Another study just to mention here, this is a study where um, from the Spanish group, again, a pre-op study, what they did was they selected basal-like cancers using IHC markers, so ER negative, PR negative, HER2 uh, negative, and also with cytokeratins as well to define, and EGFR to define a basal-like subtype. 
And they were randomized to a non-platinum containing regimen, EC followed by docetaxel, or to EC followed by docetaxel with carboplatin added. The PAT-CR rate in the standard arm was 35%. Again, that's what we get with everything, right? And in the platinum containing, when they added the platinum in, it was only 30%. So again, this database is saying that, you know, overall, unless you have a BRAC mutation, it's not really clear that the platinums really add, are better than any of the other agents that are out there. Now, aribolin, you're all familiar with. I just want to share with you this study that was presented at the San Antonio meeting. This is aribolin study 301. Um, a very large study of 1,100 patients. It's a, basically patients that were a little bit less heavily pretreated than the EMBRACE study. They could have had less than or equal to three prior chemotherapy regimens and two in the advanced disease setting. Um, had to have prior anthracitines and taxanes. And they got re randomized to Rebelin at, at standard doses or to Kepcitabine, a co-primary endpoint of overall survival and progression-free survival. And what they found overall, although there was a trend to a ribolin being, being uh, better than capsidabine, it was no way remotely statistically significant. And the difference is about a month between the patients who got capsidabine or the patients who got a ribolin. I actually think that's a pretty reasonable result to show even, uh, even um, that it was equal to capsidabine. Um, so I think this is definitely an option to use earlier on in patients with metastatic disease. However, because it was such a large trial, they did do some subgroup analysis, and in the ER negative group, you can see aribolin was better, and when they focused on the 300 patients who had triple negative breast cancer, you can see aribolin was clearly better. So perhaps a signal that this drug that, uh, that perhaps works in taxane-resistant cancers might have some uh, activity in triple negative breast cancer, but obviously needs to be confirmed in uh, further trials. And then capsidabine exabebolone, we don't talk too much about exabebolone now, but just to remind you that it had, really does appear to have clear activity in triple negative breast cancer. This is a pooled analysis of the two studies in which patients were randomized to capsidabine plus exabebolone versus capsidabine alone, focusing just on patients with triple negative breast cancer. And what you can see here is that the response rate to exabebolone and capsidabine in these highly resistant cancers, because not only are they triple negative, these patients all had had prior anthracyclines and taxanes. You can see the response rate is almost a third of patients, which I think is actually pretty good um, in this particular setting. Likewise, progression-free oh, progression survival was also significantly improved. I don't know how to go back on this. But, oh. I first of all, I think that's right. Okay. Um, regression free survival was also doubled in the combination versus the single agent. Um, so, again, I, I think selected patients, this is a nice combination to use um, in patients that perhaps have, have already progressed through your first or perhaps your second line treatment in the metastatic setting. Um, now, moving on to PARP inhibitors, I showed you this already. This is the addition of aniparib to gemcitabine and carboplatin showing no benefit for the addition of the supposed PARP inhibitor um, to, the, to, the, to the chemotherapy. And I think, just to put all the, the data that we have together with the PARP inhibitors, as it stands right now, the only patients that appear to benefit from these drugs are patients who have defects in DNA repair, in other words, BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. Um, here's some data from some metastatic studies looking at Olaparib and the Abbott drug, um, either alone or with chemotherapy. And what you can see here overall in triple negative breast cancers, there are some responses. Oh, sorry, um, th these are patients with triple negative breast cancer. Um, you can see that, that if they're BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation carriers, they do get responses. But this is the important trial shown here. In this trial with the Abbott drug, there was an, o an overall response of 56% but it was only seen in patients who have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. The patients that did not have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations did not respond to this regimen. So um, we don't have that many of those patients out there, but I think that the, if you do have patients with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations that have triple negative breast cancer, there are some trials either in development or out there that you might want to consider for them. Um, angiogenic inhibitors, uh, we talked about these earlier as well. Um, um, overall, if you look at bevacizumab in the metastatic setting from a couple of the trials that have been done, the addition of bevacizumab to paclitaxel in the first-line setting did significantly improve outcome in triple negative breast cancer. Um, in the ribbon, one of the ribbon studies, I can't remember which one it was, in the second-line setting, if you add bevacizumab to chemotherapy in the second-line setting for triple negative breast cancer, it was actually quite effective with a hazard ratio of 0.5, and bevacizumab appeared to add more, to, uh, add more when given with chemotherapy in the triple negative group compared to the hormone receptor positive group, so a suggestion of some benefit. 
But just to burst the bubble on this, of course, we now have the Beatrice study that was presented at San Antonio, large adjuvant study of 2,600 patients, all who had early stage triple negative breast cancer, and they were treated with um, either chemotherapy alone, or investigator's choice of chemotherapy alone, four to eight cycles, or with bevacizumab given at five milligrams per kilogram every week, or equivalent, so you give it every two weeks, every three weeks, followed by bevacizumab of monotherapy. So this is an adjuvant study. It's actually the first adjuvant study specifically done in patients with triple negative breast cancer. But of course, unfortunately, it was negative. You can see here that there is a, the curves are really very and superimposed. Um, there is no difference in the three-year invasive disease-free survival rate, although I would say that this looks better than perhaps you would expect for a group of patients with triple negative breast cancer. You can see that more than 80% of patients have not relapsed at three years on this, on this study. And overall survival, not surprisingly, no difference. This is an interim analysis, no difference. So unfortunately, in the ad this is the first the adjuvant studies to report, the be bevacizumab adjuvant studies to report. In this triple negative group, there was no benefit for adding in bevacizumab plus chemotherapy. <clears throat> there are a few ongoing studies that are looking at bevacizumab. This is a pre-op study run by the CLGB uh, where they're looking at adding bevacizumab to paclitaxel or carboplatin, sorry, they're looking at adding either bevacizumab or carboplatin to paclitaxel or bevacizumab and carboplatin given together with paclitaxel. That is ongoing and um, hopefully we'll get some results in the, next, uh, um, in, the, in the next year or so from this study. And then at Emory, we're actually using serafinib instead of bevacizumab. Um, serafinib being a multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor with angiogenic properties. Um, this is just for early stage resectable triple negative breast cancer. They get a lead in of serafinib as a single agent for four weeks and then get cisplatin followed by pagnotaxel with serafinib given until the second last cycle of chemotherapy. So we're referring to that study right now. Uh, EGFR, just very quickly, EGFR was interesting in triple negative breast cancer because it is um, expressed in about 50% of triple negative breast cancers. It's been looked at um, in a, a couple of trials. The Translational Breast Cancer Consortium took patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer, randomized them to cetuximab followed by, uh, sorry, cetuximab with the addition of carboplatin of progression or to cetuximab plus carbo. So Tuxmap alone had very little activity, only 6% response rate, 16% stable disease rate. And even when you added in with chemotherapy, it really wasn't that impressive. So this trial essentially does not um, uh, support investigating EGFR, or at least Tuxmap, as a single agent in triple negative breast cancer. The Spanish group did a similar study uh, for, for in the metastatic setting with cisplatin plus or minus cetuximab. They did see an improved response rate in the cisplatin uh, cetuximab arm compared to cisplatin and an improved progression-free survival, but I don't think these are that impressive to continue going on with this. I think we need to work out a way of trying to make these EGFR inhibitors more effective in this setting. And then lastly, we talked about the angioreceptor subtype before. This is kind of the way that we, I think we need to go with triple negative breast cancer. This is from the Memorial Group, and they basically screened 450 patients with triple negative breast cancer for androgen receptor expression on their tumors, and they found 12% that were androgen receptor positive. Um, they went ahead, and out of these patients they identified, they put 26 patients on bicoclutamide, um, as an anti-androgen. Um, obviously, some of these patients probably had a lot of disease and maybe couldn't go on. They didn't see any responses, but they did see stable disease greater than six months in five patients with a median progression-free survival of 12 months. So not great activity, but again, this is the way we need to be going forward, subtyping the triple negatives first and then treating them based on the, the targets that's in, that's in the cell. So lastly, just to come back to the case that we were talking about, so my thought in treating triple negative breast cancer is I like to give them preoperative chemotherapy because I know they need chemotherapy anyway, and I think we learn a lot by giving it to them preoperatively. And what I would suggest that we need to do going forward is um, give preoperative chemotherapy, send them to surgery if they have a PAT-CR or a near PAT-CR. You can tell them they're going to have a good prognosis. They don't need any more treatment. This is the group here we need to be focusing on, the patients with the residual chemo-resistant disease. It's a huge, big issue, and it's the majority of these patients. And these are patients that we need to work out the genes that are driving the, this chemo-resistant disease. And also, I think this is a very good place to look at novel agents and approaches. As far as what's driving this residual chemo-resistant disease, the Vanderbilt group presented, I'm just going to summarize a lot of work that they did just in a couple of slides. 
what, but what they did was they wanted to essentially look to see what were the, the genes and proteins that were present in this chemo-resistant residual triple negative breast cancer in patients who'd had pre-op chemo. Um, so they were able to identify about 114 patients with triple negative breast cancer who had residual disease following pre-op chemo. Uh, they did immunohistochemistry on all patients. They did nanostring digital expression on um, more than half of them, and also next-generation sequencing. And these are just the patient characteristics that are in your, your handout. Um, there's a lot of data that they show, but just to show, again, this is kind of the way forward. What they were able to show is that there were clinically targetable pathways in this residual chemo-resistant cancer. You can see that there was 40% had alterations of the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway. We know that there's a whole bunch of agents out there that are being developed for, for these, uh, these, these cancers. Um, there was, as you can see, about 10% who had DNA repair defects, usually BRCA1 or BRCA2. Also alterations of the RASMAP kinase pathway. Large number, as you would expect, had alterations of cell cycle. So again, there are agents that we could use for those. And then I think the one that we were particularly interested in is the, one, the growth factor ones. So there was ones that had IGF-1R, EGFR, MESH. So again, as we know, we have agents to look at these. So, so I think this is kind of the way forward, and this is what we've been doing off, off the trial I showed you at Emory, where we take the residual cancer in patients that have residual cancer following uh, being on our preoperative trial, put them into mice, but also are doing, you know, genomic and protein analysis, try and work out, like the Vanderbilt people did, you know, what is essentially driving these cancers. So kind of our ultimate goal is to, you know, basically have them on, the, on preoperative chemotherapy, hopefully on trials, harvest the residual chemo-resistant triple negative breast cancer, do gene expression using perhaps the Vanderbilt subtyping I showed you at the beginning of the talk, but also develop these human triple negative xenografts that will correspond with these subtypes. Um, and they're then going to take nanoparticle approaches to try and you know, target, hopefully, service uh, surface receptors that are in, in, in this residual cancer. And then I would suggest to you that where we should be doing our trials in triple negative breast cancer is in this residual chemo-resistant triple negative setting. And the reason I say that is that all the drugs, the, the trials we've done in the metastatic setting are very unimpressive because these patients are so sick, they have so much disease. These patients have micrometastatic disease. I think we're going to get a much better signal of what works and what doesn't work in that setting. So I think you're going to see that, and that's why I think the case that Jim designed was very appropriate. So just to conclude, um, this is our major, I think really one of our probably major, most major challenges in breast cancer. Very clear, we need to get away from this triple negative uh, because it's an umbrella term. And there's, uh, there's multiple subtypes there. We need to find therapeutic targets. We need to basically work out you know, what, how we can improve PAT-CR and decrease the rate of chemo resistance. And as I said, I do think using preoperative uh, approaches appears optimal. So thank you very much. <laughs>